So it's a huge, huge pleasure to welcome George Davis Smith down from Bristol. I've got lots to say about George. I can break it all down. Yeah, so I got a, a ten minute speech. Uh, no, um, just very briefly, I'm really lucky to have him come down. Very rudely, we haven't invited him down for many years, even though he's just up the road in Bristol. Um, and also very lucky because um, going back many more years, we were um, we're lucky that George stayed in science or got into science because in the late 1970s, he was actually a punk musician. And by his own admission, unfortunately for science, <laughs> his punk band were absolutely terrible. <laughs> and, and so he became an epidemiologist instead. So punk music's loss um, is epidemiology's um, uh, gain. But no, um, George, George is the leading epidemiologist in the country, so it's a huge pleasure to welcome him down. He's also a fantastic scholar. He knows the history of epidemiology in his field extremely well. In fact, this can be extremely annoying. Uh, in, in many ways, because uh, if, you, if you're doing anything related to epidemiology or genetic epidemiology and you think you've got something new and interesting, uh, you want to write a grant, you want to write a paper, you want to... sending it to, I'd recommend not sending this to George because within minutes, he'll send back an email saying, very nice, Tim, but this was first discovered in 1912 <laughs> uh, and here's the paper uh, to, to show it. So. Um, he came to Exeter, I guess, visited Andrew and I um, more than 20 years ago. And he, I remember him saying, guys, why don't you look at genes and genetic variants They're actually doing something and actually doing something meaningful? Because in those days, Andrew and I would publish papers saying, oh, this gene is not associated with type 2 diabetes. Then a few months later, we published another paper saying, Gene B is not associated with type 2 diabetes, and then a year later, gene C is not associated with type 2 diabetes. Anyway, George realized that there were genetic variants which actually did something, and he had this um, amazing idea, which there had been a little bit of history of, but he deserves a huge amount of credit for bringing it to the forefront, which is that genetic variants can act as proxies for clinical trials, proxies for the environment to test causality much more robustly than uh, observational data and, and more often more feasibly than in clinical trials. And that was the birth of Mendelian randomization. And he's now going to talk about the death of Mendelian randomization. <laughs> <laughs> George, well, thanks. thanks very much. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, and it's uh, yeah, a pleasure to be, uh, uh, to be here, to be back here. Uh, I, I, Tim was, uh, being uh, overly modest about uh, my visit over 20 years ago. Andrew was talking about it. It was in, could have been in, two, it was in uh, 2000. So it was more, it's 20, yeah, what, it's 23 years ago. Uh, well, I knew absolutely fuck all about <laughs> but I just had, but I had, had this thought about, uh, about causal inference. Uh, and they, and uh, Tim in particular, uh, Andrew got bored quite soon trying to, <laughs> trying to teach me genetics. Tim in particular, uh, uh, spent a lot of time uh, helping me um, through, through, the, through the basics, and I'm certainly still at that um, at a basic level, but uh, definitely uh, uh, helped me uh, avoid some uh, embarrassments <laughs> would now be uh, could now be dug out. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, Tim and Andrew, I think, at the end of the 2003 uh, MR paper with uh, a list of people who really helped uh, me, me learn something about that. But definitely here was one of the most important, most important places. So I'm going to give a 22-year uh, retrospective, just very briefly at the beginning, uh, about Medina randomization, just to say what it, why it was introduced, because I think it's important to think to remember why it was introduced when now it's being used in so many different uh, contexts, uh, a lot of them uh, about um, uh, biological variation, fundamental principles and the threats. And uh, I might get onto some opportunities, but uh, I might just stop. So it might be the death, but it might there might be a few balls at the end. Um, so I'm an epidemiologist. I'm, my my interest is uh, almost entirely in how quantifiable factors of disease so you can do something about to prevent or treat uh, disease. That's what epidemiologists um, epidemiologists do. So my only interest in genetics uh, is is in how it can actually inform us about quantifiable causes and things that the environment does. 
Uh, and why it was needed was that you know uh, epidemiology was 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 in a sort of sort of crisis because there had just been this whole spate of things that have been some of the most uh, some of the strongest hypotheses that uh, epidemiology has advanced uh, that that uh, that didn't live up to. Oh, to, to the hope. So, for example, uh, these are uh, two back to back papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, massively cited at the time, that came out and showed that uh, uh, observationally people who used vitamin E supplements uh, had, a, had a lower risk of chronic heart disease by about 40% lower. They replicated it uh, in another cohort. So, they showed the same existed in, in two cohorts. They did the standard thing that you do in a, you do in observational studies, which is they statistically adjusted for things like smoking, physical activity, diet, uh, things that they thought might confound the association. Uh, but you know, the associations remained uh, remained robust, and these were really uh, um, consequential. You know, this was like this was the front page of the New York Times. The vitamin E greatly reduces risk of heart disease. Studies suggest so. You know, there's a causal claim. It reduces heart disease. And as you might imagine, um, uh, taking large doses was best. And uh, at one stage uh, following this, uh, nearly 50% of the US adult population were taking supplements that contained vitamin D. Some of them were multivitamins, some of them were just vitamin E. But vitamin E supplementation use just absolutely shot up. Uh, but luckily, some trials were established, randomized controlled trials, with the longest but they about 13 years follow up. And when you actually randomize people to the supplements, so precisely the same things were studied in the observational studies, taking supplements, they randomized them to these very same supplements, and there was absolutely no effect on uh, coronary heart disease events. And this was shown again and again with selenium and prostate cancer, vitamin C and cancer and coronary heart disease, uh, and, and, and other, other things like hormone replacement therapy, et cetera, things which looked really promising. Um, at work. So actually vitamins was a, a, a chunk of the uh, origin of, um, uh, uh, um, of the sort of, uh, situation epidemiology was in. And one of the clues really was that observationally vitamins appeared to be good for everything. I mean, in fact, that, that's not unlikely to happen. But vitamin, vit you know, vitamins were protecting against dual cancers, they were protecting against coronary heart disease. Uh, and in the in the hormone replacement therapy uh, uh, use uh, area, Diana Petiti uh, looked at people observationally, looked at people dying in car crashes. And sure enough, hormone replacement therapy protected against dying in car crashes to the same extent as it protected against uh, against coronary heart disease. So if things look good for everything, they're unlikely to be good for anything. Uh, and uh, negative controls, as they're now now called, looking at things which are unlikely or impossible to be influenced by your exposures uh, are a good thing, and they're a good thing to use in the media minimization, as I will show, okay, I hope to show. In RCTs, not so much. Uh, and uh, uh, residual confounding and the, the, uh, measurement error uh, generate these associations. Something like 30 something, 32 years ago, uh, um, Andy Phillips and I uh, looked at uh, HDL cholesterol, which was then known as good cholesterol. It was colloquially known as good cholesterol. It was thought to protect against coronary heart disease, strongly protect against coronary heart disease. And, um, uh, and, and we, we looked at the British Regional Heart Study. We got the standard result, everyone did, which was that uh, triglycerides had an adverse effect, uh, adverse association, HDL cholesterol, an apparent protective effect when he mutually adjusted them, the HDL cholesterol effect remained robust. And we just simply simulated levels of measurement error because it's known that triglycerides respond if you eat a meal, full English breakfast, your triglycerides zoom up. If you eat a full English breakfast, your HDL cholesterol doesn't shift. So triglycerides, there's much more measurement error, they're much more variable. Uh, and um, uh, if, you, if you simulate it, a slightly greater measurement error in triglycerides, then you saw the same thing, uh, the same sort of pattern, although it got less stark. But then if you just simply change one of one of the, cor the intra-class correlations you, you're using for two measures of the same thing, 0.6, it just flips. It flips. So we thought this is the book of very stable. If you change another one by 0.05 and everything's back again. 
So, uh, so we, we, we concluded that the evidence of good cholesterol uh, wasn't as uh, strong uh, as, it was, uh, as it was said to be. Uh, but I mean, you know, still in 2009, uh, these um, huge collaborative studies of pairing short, which showed precisely the same thing. The same thing that all of this did show, which was that triglycerides, the effect on adjustment for HDL cholesterol was abolished, HDL cholesterol remained so, sort of robust. Uh, and the conclusion was that, uh, that, that you could get substantial benefit from raising HDL cholesterol. Now, literally billions, literally billions of dollars were spent on, uh, on, on a very large, a large series of um, randomized controlled trials that raised HDL cholesterol using a whole host of different methods. And simply raising HDL cholesterol level has no effect on uh, on coronary heart disease risk, and this sort of attenuation is precisely what you'd expect to see, but it's just, it's just measurement error uh, in, in confounders. And uh, the uh, conclusion is that if you've got no, if you think if you if you if you think you've got no unmeasured confounding, and you think you've taken into account measurement error, then you're not looking at epidemiological data because in epidemiological data. That situation uh, doesn't doesn't doesn't, doesn't arise. So we were sort of, uh, uh, interested in this, got interested in this in the late nineties because we were working on folate and homocysteine. There was a lot of interest then, thinking that homocysteine was a, a causal factor for coronary heart disease. Uh, folate uh, reduced homocysteine uh, levels, um, and that therefore folate supplementa supplementation by folate. Might, uh, might reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. So we did an observational study uh, and we, we considered in, in detail uh, possibilities of measurement error, possibilities of residual confounding, and concluded that in our study, we thought there was, the evidence was not strong that homocysteine was causal or, and, and the way the results changed on adjustment, even though they didn't atten attenuate to the null, were what you'd expect given uh, measurement error. But a, a, an enthusiast, one of the major um, promoters of the notion that folate supplementation uh, should be considered widely, wrote in and criticised our study. And it was uh, at this stage, it's in March 2001, I think. Yeah, yeah March 2001, that we, we first reported on looking at MTHFR genetic variant, uh, which related to. Uh, that were homocysteine, presumably through sort of more uh, higher uh, folate uh, activity. And uh, we were ridiculous in why confidence intervals. Uh, so, you know, there's some doubts to be, to be thrown on this. And, um, uh, and, and then that was the first time I used the term the mathematization, which had been used in a different context in ingenious design, sibling design. To look at to, to try and get evidence on the effectiveness of uh, treatments for childhood hematopoietic poetic cancers, um, which is an ingenious, a really ingenious design that I won't go into now. Uh, the term had been introduced for that uh, and uh, suggested that this approach uh, could, be, uh, could be advanced. And in the paper that we thanked uh, uh, Tim and Andrew uh, forcibly at the end uh, came out in um, 2000. And three, and again, had uh, MTHFR being one of the very few sort of variants with biology, which clearly did have biological effects, was a major example uh, through it. With some pathetically low number of small sample sizes, we demonstrated that the genetic variant wasn't, wasn't associated with conventional confounders, uh, which was the whole basis of, uh, of doing these, uh, of doing the studies. Um, and um, that, that this was this was a way of getting some evidence using genetics to get evidence on whether an environmental uh, intervention such as folate uh, might have an effect. So you, you were using the genetics not to say this is the genetic basis of the disease or for genetic testing or looking at gene environment interactions, but for looking uh, for the main effect of folate supplementation. But illustrating, you know, the difficulties. At the time, which was the tiny sample sizes, the, the, these estimates that I was making, which I, I will, I, um, you could write a letter into the uh, part or the IJE because I wrongly calculated, I didn't take into account 
the, uh, the, the standard errors correctly of the, uh, the denominator, of the denominator. And these were wrong. They weren't wrong by that much. But these were wrong. The RS were wrong. We, we got it. We started getting it right later. But um, uh, if you put together all the data as we did in 2005 uh, that was related MTHFR um, to uh, heart disease, uh, we, we found there was no overall. There was no good evidence uh, that, that, that there was an effect. And by then, there was tight confidence intervals in European studies. Uh, but it was impossible to. It was impossible to say whether in uh, especially East Asian uh, countries there might have uh, were very low folate populations there might have been a beneficial effect. And actually, the situation is, is, uh, is still the same as regards to the lack of confirmation of, uh, of, of whether there might be effects in very, in very, low, very low countries. But randomized trials, by the way, we then done folate in European countries and showed no benefit for uh, coronary heart disease. And uh, we introduced uh, uh, MR as relating to um, Mendelian transmission from parents to offspring. So we said that the analogy, uh, that the, uh, the only analogy with randomized trials was when you're actually following genetic variants uh, from parents to off offspring within families uh, as they followed the Mendelian law. So that was essentially uh, a really good quasi-randomization. And, 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 and that was uh, uh, when this could be done. And in, in that situation, we said that there was an analogy. But the problem was that there was, uh, there was just no data. That we did not have data or family data at that time uh, uh, to actually do this, do proper Mendelian randomization, which would be following the genetic variants. And uh, we, we sort of demonstrated this is that's what you'd want to do. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something I wish I'd we, we'd carried on saying, which we didn't carry on saying enough, I, I, I don't think. We, we, we said that uh, uh, populations share much common ancestry uh, and therefore in association studies. Uh, although it's not, not as well protected against potential distorting factors, obviously such as population stratification, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, as, par as paradoxical comparisons, you could use population data, but, it, it, but it, this is approximate uh, medium randomization. We should really start to determine approximate medium randomization for that, uh, that, that uh, drift. But now, of course, with, with uh, studies like UK Biobank, uh, Hunt, and others, you can actually put together large enough samples uh, of, uh, sibling, of, of sibling pairs and do within sibship analysis, which is the true um, uh, Mendelian randomization. Uh, and, uh, and in these situations, you notice uh, that, for example, um, social exposures such as educational attainment, et cetera, uh, are, you know, are distorted by dynastic effects, et cetera. But the basic uh, sort of model for Mendelian randomization um, is conventional studies that are confounded. If you use the gen genetic variable that's associated with exposure, like MTHFR does with home assisted, then the joint association of the genetic variant and your exposure, and the genetic variant and your outcome, allows you to make some estimation of the, uh, of the causal effect of the exposure uh, uh, on the outcome. And the, the fundamental assumption there has to be that the genetic variation uh, is mimicking the environmental variation. And the, 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 the genetic changes in a phenotype would have the same effect as other, as other changes in the phenotype that, that you, would, you, could, you could do through, for example, supplementation. And in sort of monogenic uh, conditions, there was, you know, there's, there's some examples of such gene environment equivalence, I mean, such as. Uh, the disease pellagra caused by uh, a lack of niacin looks uh, somewhat similar phenotypically to Hartnup's disease, uh, which is now known to be a genetic disorder, uh, uh, resulting poor absorption of tryptophan, which is converted to niacin. And so, and so these, uh, and so this sort of uh, sort of similarity of phenotype uh, caused by um, in, in, caused by genetic variation in the environment is, is key. And there was, you know, there was, there was a, a long list of literature in developmental genetics of, of gene environment equivalence and gene environment interchangeability. So can Campbell and Billet said, you know, no doubt all environmental effects can be mimicked by one or several mutations, which I think 
going a bit over the top and being getting hit by a truck. Probably <laughs> you can't think of a genetic variant that would mimic that, but uh, for, for normal biology, that would be the case. And you know, for some situations, like for example, uh, 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 LDL cholesterol, you, you're saying, well, diet, cholesterol, low medication, ex, uh, you know, other things that normal uh, biological ways that, that modify the exposure, uh, um, which have the same effect on the outcome. Now, in the case of LDL cholesterol, then, then of course, there, there is, of course, the matching of some uh, uh, drugs like HMG co-reductase inhibitors or statins with genetic variation HMG co-reductase or PSK9 inhibitors uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and genetic variation PCSK9 obviously match up cetamide and you can pick one like uh, C1, um, which relates to cholesterol trans transfer across the gut. They match up. So in this situation, the gene environment equivalent seems reasonable because the the, 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 the drug that you're taking is an external factor uh, that has the same name of its mechanism as is the name of the gene which it uh, acts on. And, but of course, uh, you know, uh, um, in genetic studies, you are obviously looking at lifetime or, or long term differences. And for example, cholesterol levels you know, from, for, you know, from birth on at least, because you, you can show these variants relate to cholesterol uh, levels at birth and cause blood. So the drug trials, you've given the drug, say, five years. So you, you wouldn't expect that five years of cholesterol lowering would match to the same effect, same pathological effect as, as a lifetime of having higher cholesterol. You know, we know that atherosclerosis starts in adolescence. 18-year-old American soldiers in the Korean War obviously had a fair amount of uh, uh, but, but, but But the scaling uh, across the different drugs, these are different drugs against, against the genetic... Uh, the, the genes that those drugs target, the scaling of the effect is such that, that you get about 35 to 40 percent of the predicted long term effect in genetic studies in the drug trials. But when thinking about gene environment equivalence, then it's really important to take into account the length of the time that things are working. The genes are doing it for a long term, uh, the drugs are doing it for short term. But, but I think that. that, that uh, the gene environment equivalence is, the, is the, the, to me, the fundamental assumption of, of Mendelian randomization. And the one that, if you're trying to use Mendelian randomization to talk about environmental exposures, and the one that needs to be justified in all situations. And if anyone has looked at the MR strobe or strobe MR guidelines, they say that they, this is very clear as the guidelines that this, this should be discussed, this should be part of your discussion. Uh, and uh, well, it's justifying in all situations will, will relate to biological processes that are influenced by genetic variants, usually. And so that the equivalence will only exist, of course, with those processes, because those are the only things you can actually study with genetic variants. So consider BMI as the phenotype. Um, and, uh, you know, are there, are there genetic variants that relate to higher calorie intake? Well, FGO does indeed seem to relate to uh, a higher calorie intake, but there might be other methods other mechanisms as well but yes there will be variation that relates to physical activity level but this sort of cute example that Miguel Hernan uses of, of, you know to question uh, you know some forms of causal reasoning you, you could reduce your BMI by chopping your leg off and that would reduce your BMI but you'd think it'd be unlikely to actually make you live longer but of course there'd be no norm there's no genetic variation which will mimic losing the leg and then, but then think about, so then it becomes more complicated when you think of things like smoking. I mean, there is genetic variation which influences smoke, you know, the Corona 5 variant. And indeed, in people who have carried that variant who smoke, they, 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 they get, they get, they get, they get, they get a higher dose uh, of the bad things from smoking. Uh, and that relates to lower BMI. But you're not going to want to use Corona 5 as an instrument for, um, uh, for BMI. So, uh, so, so one needs to think about whether whether the gene environment equivalence is plausible, and you can't think about whether the gene environment equivalence is plausible when you've just got a lot vast number of anonymous genetic variants. We don't know why they're relating to the exposure. We talked about limitations in MR, and then Duncan Thomas uh, uh, um, through David Clayton got the message to me that this was just instrumental variables. David and I. My face planted when he said this because we were how, how stupid that we hadn't realized that this was a sort of 
uh, instrumental variable approach, and I therefore invited Duncan to write a commentary pointing that out in the IJE when, the, when I think that this was the first time this now very well known uh, sort of diagram uh, was introduced. And uh, in an instrumental variable, what you, what you would then be calling these genetic variants, uh, you, you're, you're, you have to have these three conditions, which is the first, the genetic variant does indeed relate reliably to your exposure. But secondly, there's no confounding of your genetic variant and your outcome. So there must, there must be confounding of genetic variant and outcome. Now, in genetic studies, uh, of course, the confounding you would think of would be population stratification. Another form of confounding, though, would be dynastic effects, which is that your genetic variants that your parents have could change the environment that you, you grow up in, which includes intrauterine environment in the case of genetic variants your mothers have, could change the environment you grow up in, and that your, your genetic variant would be transmitted uh, the genetic variants you've got transmitted from your parents would then be correlate with the environment, even uh, even if they're only influencing the environment in your parents, they're influencing the environment in your parents. And for example, the intrauterine environment, of course, you don't experience your own intrauterine environment. Mm -hmm. So that link would give you the wrong answers about uh, about the genetic variant of the individuals. And in fact, in the 2003 paper, Shah and I illustrated the, these things are now called. Um, uh, dynastic effects, the term used now, it wasn't used then. We illustrated this in, in the 2003 paper through another example using MPHFR, one of them, and still, uh, I think, a lovely example, which is that, uh, you know, folate, a uh, low folate in mothers increases the risk of neural tube defects in the offspring, and this is known through randomized controlled trials. Now, if, if uh, even, at the, even in 2003, yeah, there's enough data to show that uh, if a mother if your mother uh, carries a genetic variant related to lower folate activity and higher homocysteine, you had a twofold risk of having a neural, neural tube defect. If your father had this, of course, th th that doesn't influence the intrauterine environment, so there's no, there's no effect to the father's genotype. This is the negative control that I'm talking about, the negative controls are so, so powerful, especially in pair of studies when your dad's, dad's uh, genotype, the genotype would be a negative control that, that might not really influence the intrauterine environment. But if you did the Mendelian randomization study in the, in the first of the people with neural tube defects, that's what they're adults, you would get this sort of answer that it appeared that maybe the folate, <laughs> well, obviously the, their folate isn't influenced, not their folate uh, as adults is influencing it. But the logic would be you would get this answer wrong. So these dynastic effects, these effects can be really important for things like educational attainment. Where if the parents carry variants related to higher education attainment, there'll be more books in the house, and you'll you'll both get the genotypes, but you'll also get an enriched environment. So you'd overestimate the effect uh, of your own genotype uh, on the outcomes because it's coming through these dynastic effects. So that's an important form of confounding of what would, what is essentially confounding uh, that can that can exist. But then, of course, the thing that's most thought about is the horizontal biotrophy, where the genetic variant influences your phenotype, your exposure of interest, but is also influencing um, your outcome through, uh, through, through other, other patterns. And here, um, one of the things that was done early on in, uh, in animal studies isn't done now is people say, well, we can test, the, we can test these biases by just adjusting for the intermediate phenotype. But if we're just for the intermediate phenotype and it's, it, it, it's, it's what's causing things, then the association should go away. Now, this is a problem. I'm going to finish on this problem as well. This is a problem uh, uh, that, that if you do, if you adjust for something, which is the outcome of more than, uh, the outcome of more than one process, then you introduce what's known as collider bias, which I think is now increasingly sort of widely uh, recognized. But uh, an, you know, an example of how conditioning on a common effect associations would be in a sort of US university where people either get uh, or either uh, admitted through uh, uh, their SAP schools, their academic ability, or they are sports scholarships. So you can get into the university because you're, you're good at uh, baseball or whatever. Uh, you can, and you can imagine this in the, in the general population, there's absolutely no correlation between sporting prowess and academic ability. They are un unrelated. 
but you go onto the campus of one of these universities, there's a student over there and you throw the ball to them and they try and catch the ball and it bounces off their head and they fall over backwards. As you go and pick them up, you can say to them, you must be very clever <laughs> because you know, you know that they are not there because they've got, they've got an academic, they've got a, a sporting scholarship. In fact, those things become correlated minus 0.6. In, 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 that, in that situation. So you can get these very strong correlations uh, uh, for adjusting for the consequent, known as collider bias. So if you adjust for X, everything else that relates to your exposure then becomes related to your genetic variant. So you, you, reintroduce, you reintroduce compounding by adjusting, uh, adjusting for, the, for the consequent. I'll skip that. And a, 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 a two minutes, a very well known early example of MR was something quite important negative. It was C reactive protein, uh, which most of you have all heard about. It's an acute phase reactant. Every, anything bad you do increases your C reactive protein, but it was strongly associated with coronary heart disease. And if you adjusted it for a huge number of things, that association remained. And drug companies were trying to develop C reactive protein inhibitors because it thought it was, it thought it was going to be the new bias drug. And C reactive protein relates to every, every single thing that's bad, as I said, observationally associates with C reactive protein. But using a promoter region cis variant in CRP, it just doesn't, you know, the, the MR in this situation is doing what it says on the tip. The, the variant doesn't relate to any of the confounders. And the MR, the instrument of variable estimates, is absolutely not. It's null, and the, the drugs stop being developed. And you know, CRP and other examples of CRP and every other outcome you can imagine, because people have said CRP might cause many cancers, and diabetes, and things like that. And all of them, uh, all of these uh, MR findings, like with the HDL cholesterol, these findings were all uh, null. And uh, I'll skip it. Multivariable MR was used to show that HDL cholesterol didn't, uh, didn't predict coronary heart disease. I did start late, Andrew, so I don't think I'm going on the <laughs> I'm on. Uh, 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 um, so uh, uh, now I'm finally got to the title of my talk. So noodles. So the, the, the threats to Mendelian randomization uh, from this very quite simple model with these 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 well specified variants related to an exposure, which were informative. We now these are noodles. I noodles I put because this got very widely shared on Twitter, and a paper came out saying positive causal relationship between noodle and metabolic syndrome. And yeah, you know, from UK Biobank, they, goo, goo, they, they, they've got the GWAS from the, from probably from IEU Open GWAS or the Neil Lab uh, uh, available data. And people had GWAS, whether you've got noodle intake and the, the, the laws of variable genetic supply, every single trait is heritable. Once you start getting huge sample sizes, you get genome wide significant hits for noodle intake. They're very unlikely to be in any way specific to noodle intake. The genome <laughs> equivalence is unlikely to be true. This, 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 I think the shame is this wasn't, this was in no way a, one of the worst papers. I took all of Tim's papers out because he told me, <laughs> he, had, he, had, he asked me to remove his papers. But uh, the, the causal effects of COVID-19 on cancer risk. So your GWAS, you know, we, we, I'm the Human Genome Initiative COVID GWAS is, and you looked at susceptibility, you looked at getting infected and then getting seriously infected, and people then use that GWAS to look at cancer. But they're looking at cancer that, that from studies that were obviously set up before. So there clearly was no COVID-19, but of course they all show effects because IL-6 is a strong influence on COVID severity, and IL-6 does indeed have a lot of biological effects and many other things, including educational attainment that was related, was related, related to becoming infected, and, uh, you know, relate to it. Or this one, lipid lowering therapy. I mentioned the gene environment equivalence and the genetic variants related to the drugs. This, believe it or not, was uh, GWASing. There's three different types of statins were used by reasonable numbers of people in UK Biobank, including a tumor statin, simvastatin, and what else? And one of them. They GWAS which statin people were on, and then used those GWASs to say to make claims about uh, about the the, the effects of, the, of that statin. I mean, whether you're on a torvastatin or simvastatin is probably relates to uh, how up to date your doctor is. And, and that will relate to, you know, to, to, to where the doctor works and uh, et cetera. And you do indeed get hits for this. These anonymous, few anonymous, you know, a few SNPs are related to that. And you can get estimates. But these are clearly ridiculous. Uh, and then 
Particulate matter 2.5, that's just basically your address because they use the address in UK Biobank and, and, and linked data on the uh, on, on local environmental solution. They, they GWAS your address and then and then make claims about uh, about two point about uh, uh, particulate matter exposure or habitual consumption of alcohol with meals. I mean, everyone can guess why that is related to uh, lower lung cancer uh, uh, risk. Um, you know the, 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 the Types of people who uh, who, reg who regularly consume alcohol with meals rather than uh, in the pub where they're standing outside smoking away. I mean, so so anyway. But, but these are these are just this is, these are zooming up. These this this is pub uh, annual. Uh, this is with Mendelian randomization in the type. So these are papers that are quite are just purely Mendelian randomization studies. It's more, more than a thousand a year. It's going to be uh, two thousand. Pretty soon. This is uh, per month. This is per week. And uh, Will Gill, who runs the MR Lit uh, 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 Twitter site, who some of you uh, may, I, may follow, who really kindly sent me these uh, from the on there from PubMed, because I asked for the, 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 the numbers of papers he was tweeting per day. But the, the, there's a limit of three per day that you're allowed to you're allowed to tweet with a, with a sort of bot system. So now there's now there's way more than you can than not, than you can, there's more than can be kept up. Um, uh, and this is this is similar to this. There was this huge increase in meta analyses, genetic meta analyses, that came from China. And this is because people were rewarded in China for publishing papers. Uh, they, you can use available data in meta analyses and in Mendelian uh, randomization. But uh, so if you go back to 2015, before this takeoff, this is where we, we put out MR Base, this automated this platform where you could just easily do, uh, do, do this at home. And then in 2015, a paper came out saying that C-reactive protein levels uh, gave you schizophrenia. protein gave you schizophrenia. There was a, another paper at the same time came out saying, if anything, C-reactive protein is protective against schizophrenia. And uh, Fernando Hartwig and Jim, Jim Hermani uh, 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 looked at the data and they discovered that in, in, in one of these papers that that uh, they not harmonised the data correctly. If the data were correctly uh, uh, harmonised with uh, you know correct strand line, etc., uh, then that, that had generated the effect. And then we did that. We published this. And uh, I've talked about the downsides. <laughs> we now we really are living through these downsides of the potential powerful um, um, approach. Uh, and the paper was attracted. But you can't do you can't do uh, aim for case by case attractions. So at actually at that time, and this is a, this is a, this is our shame. We introduced them on base. But uh, at that time, uh, uh, we, we did a, we, we 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 said what we're going to do is do the Mendelian randomization of everything against everything and put it online and then say no one should be able to publish just the two sample Mendelian randomization study because we've done them all. <laughs> and we showed we showed using, uh, 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 we provided these were the numbers of traits there, and we showed using years of schooling how you've got impossible findings clearly based in education, education being, things been upstream education and downstream education, confusing directions, etc. Uh, but but the, the naughty thing is, of course, it's still, it's still is only on bioarchive. It was reviewed quite nicely by Nature Genetics, and we never, it, but so much data was arriving all the time, Chip wants to do everything properly, right? Uh, we, we never actually published it, but we so this is our, it's our, to our shame that we never published this paper, because this was to say that this, this was predicting this avalanche that's, that, that, that's, that, that's not true. And the, um, you know, and an issue is that. You can't just simply say noodles on the basis of a the title. I know that's what I that's what I've done. I mean, here's a paper which fits many of the criteria. But we, we just read the name. You need genetic diatrophic regulation of atrial fibrillation risk is mediated through an effect on height. You think hang about that doesn't sound that plausible. But their discussion that they, what they did was their discussion of it was, was, was very was very good. And they they said that their findings suggested that the AF association is doing part. The effect of genetically modulated TSH, TSH signal growth during childhood, which is possible. They didn't show enough evidence to support this, but uh, you can do uh, within in UK Biobank childhood height, people's height at age 10 was reported, and you can do um, uh, MR as, as its own uh, uh, 
range of height observation found in MR relates to higher atrial fibrillation risk. But if you look, if you, if you look at childhood height, and uh, which is which is in red, and adulthood height, the effect on atrial fibrillation does indeed appear to be through childhood height. So there might well there might be something in that paper. In that paper, that's, that's the problem. Is there there might be stuff to be there's stuff to be learned, but just simply through producing uh, all these papers, that's not the way forward. Second problem is no nulls. The 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 in, you know, you're now seeing very few null and randomization papers. The influential and, in my view, important you know, important MR papers with nulls on things like c reactive protein, HDL cholesterol, and many other things. It was telling people not to follow up things that were spurious. And then, you know, with c reactive protein, the important follow up from that was then showing that IL6, which regulates c reactive protein, yeah, IL6 does appear to have causal effects on coronary heart disease. Now, show it, you know, that's been sort of demonstrated in randomized trials, and IL6 clearly had an effect on. COVID, and that was shown in, uh, in very early MR in the, during, during, during the pandemic. But the, the, but, but, so, but, but the nulls are no longer being seen. This Mendelian randomization and, and vitamin D in the title, here's the numbers of papers. Uh, this is, uh, I'm the only noodle who's, who's puts his name on the paper. That I, was, I was the noodle on the 2007 one, which was, was something which is not an instrument now, when, when looked at in larger numbers saying that vitamin D had an effect on self-perceived height. But the sensible vitamin D papers, uh, the, the ones which came out like vitamin D and C-reactive protein, C-reactive protein didn't actually, you know, did, didn't uh, influence vitamin D. So these negative papers were coming out and nearly all the vitamin D ones, except on, on multiple sclerosis, the, the vitamin D papers were not. They were really important notes because uh, um, which matched the randomized trials of vitamin D that were done. We said that if, you know, everyone thought vitamin D was going to prevent everything, just like vitamin E was and vitamin C was, and et cetera. Uh, but now the recent papers have all have suddenly, well, this should be a huge of the Have been through this, a new method to introduce the nonlinear MR, which then brought the result that there's a lot of vitamin D enthusiasts want. Uh, which suggested that at the low, at lower levels of vitamin D, in fact, in the lower, just the lower 50% of UK biobank, there was an effect, and these were widely uh, welcomed by, uh, this is the editorial to targeting into people with deficiency. There was this paper on cardiovascular disease that showed exactly the same thing. Here's the press release that came out with that paper, Sunshine Vitamin that delivers for cardio health. In the press release, it said, uh, uh, you, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's there. In the press release, it said that there was also exciting as it showed that vitamin D uh, to, pe to people up to, uh, up to 50 nanomoles per litre, which is about uh, uh, the median point of uh, vitamin D levels in the UK biobank. So, for people in the lower half, uh, that they would benefit from supplementation. Uh, this, this is exactly the sort of setting where these genetic data are important. And this, it is not ethical to recruit people with vitamin D deficiency to a randomized controlled trial and leave them without treatment for long periods. And a severe deficiency in the press release was set before at fifteen percent of UK Black Bank. So just deficiency probably relates to the people below fifty. Not ethical to do a trial. You shouldn't do trials based on this on these findings. Anyway, there's loads more of these, and then one on C-reactive protein. The editorialist said the epidemiological quest for the role of vitamin D turned nonlinear and simply made sense. And then <laughs> these are all positive. It's all positive. Something like that upturn. There are no nulls. Uh, because there's suddenly something which got you the answers that you wanted, the answers that people wanted uh, was produced. But that comes to numb skulls, and by numb skulls, I'm talking about methods that make your head hurt because it's really quite impossible. It's quite difficult for people unless that they are actually you know, fully specialising in this area, possible uh, to understand the methods uh, correctly. The different methods don't get critiqued correctly, and, and the non-linear. Uh, MR of vitamin D. These are the observational associations. For those, sorry, the low point is 50 and the observational set, uh, things and the uh, estimates for, or, and it's everything, it relates to everything, as it says, things that protect against everything tends not to be true. Uh, and then, uh, so, so this, this was a figure in the paper. So the, these are four strata of, and these are the causal estimates, causal estimates from Mendelian randomization strata. 
and it, you know, deficient and then insufficient below. That was uh, that was still, you know, not use significant in Bristol, but you know, significant benefit right the way up to the medium of the vitamin D levels in the population. Every one of them, every one of the strata lies on the protective side, but the overall is 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 that, is is, if any, is, is absolutely no. I mean, uh, if you can. Uh, uh, Everyone knows about Simpson's paradox, but if you think you're actually looking at cause, because these things are causal, and you know the distribution of the variables between the, between the, the strata, this is literally impossible, just not possible. And, uh, uh, and the authors wrote, wrote in and, uh, uh, and, and, and recognized, uh, re recognized that. So MR is simply recapitulating confounded observational findings in the field with null findings. So as, as vitamins was one of the, one of the, uh, Drivers for introducing many of them. This is a rather sad thing. And then saying it's not ethical to recruit people into trials. Uh, it's, it's, uh, th th this was the conclusion from this was the last words of the paper that Shah and I wrote in 2003. Said, uh, you know, um, it's probably fair to say that the method offers a more robust approach to understanding the effects of some blood plant exposure from health vitamins than as much conventional observational epidemiology. Where possible, randomized controlled trials remain the final arbiter of the effects of interventions. So, the notion that Mendelian randomization is being used to actually say we don't even need to do trials in these situations uh, is, is, is a huge step backwards, in my view. The authors uh, of the, of the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology paper uh, 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 have, um, have, have uh, said that the results are, are spurious and have introduced a new method, the doubly ranked method. Uh, um, which um, doesn't show any beneficial effects at any level. But it's very clear that people with Frank Ricketts need vitamin D, but that's that's not uh, that's a very small majority, small number of people in any of these studies. So I talked about negative controls, and this is one of the really I think very powerful thing when when uh, just as a sanity check when you got methods. So um, vitamin D, we saw that at the lower level it uh, does indeed uh, apparently. Protect and Mendelian randomization from everything. And uh, here's using the two methods for central and rank. This is how old you are. Vitamin D makes you, changes your age. <laughs> it's precisely the same methodological approach, precisely the same statistical package. You get that it changes, that it changes your age and it changes, uh, and I say both methods show the same, and it changes your sex. So there we, so, 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 so this is how you, this is, these sorts of sanity checks are the things that can be used methods, and I'd like to say negative control should be used, uh, used more widely. Now, I would say this is that I'm the only noodle on this paper. This was a paper which used nonlinear uh, MR looking at BMI and mortality. There was a paper uh, also in the BMJ, which got much more uh, attention but not, not from us. So we have, we've just recently, this, we've published a, a commentary explaining the problems with this method. And here we're doing exactly the same negative control as on BMI, and you see the same thing. Both methods uh, uh, change, uh, change your sex. Uh, say, that, say that BMI changes your sex. Now, this is probably due to, due to the differential selection bias. You get very different selection bias into people, people are very thin as fat. So, so, so uh, this will be picking up selection bias, but it will also be picking up the just straightforward uh, errors that the, the residual uh, method very first of the two methods. Uh, it's just very clearly. Uh, uh, erroneous for other reasons. And uh, uh, I think partly of the line of noodles, noodles and non skulls is just increasing GMAS size. The simulation of the jib, uh, uh, jib you know, just simulating the probability of the GMAS hit being a direct effect uh, as, 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 the, as, as the sample, as the smaller effect sizes. It's very obvious when you think that, that you know, all phenotypes are introduced by upstream phenotypes, smoking influences BMI, educational attainment influences smoking. But as your GWASs get bigger and bigger and bigger, your hits for BMI will include more things which are smoking, uh, educational attainment, uh, um, which are upstream and clearly are confounders. So you just reintroduce the confounding you get in observational studies. Once from GWAS the whole world, MR will just give you the same as its observation are. Uh, and you see this with the CRP example. Here's, here's, this, here's the cis variant of the founders, and this is the, from Dan Russo. Here's now using the latest CRP uh, polygenic score 
suggests that CRP makes you make you smoke. Or you know, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so 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 once you take these instruments from using that these vast G buses, you just recapitulate profoundly. And I think that I think that, that this 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 takes us back to what I see as the fundamental uh, the fundamental assumption of medieval minimization, which is gene environment equivalence. You know, we talked about the problems with you know smoking, getting up bloodstream things, but what you also then just start to pick up is reverse cause from disease processes. So if you've got genetic variants that relate to diseases, then once you get large, very large samples, people will have that disease process. And the genetic variants will actually relate to your exposure through uh, 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 through the disease, and, 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 and the effect size will be large enough for it to become GWAS significant. Atheroma, atherosclerosis, is an inflammatory process, but so you see RP. So uh, you know, so genetic the, the genetic variants for coronary heart disease will become apparently genome-wide significant for CRP and um, uh, etc. So. So you, so you need to consider gene environment equivalence. And when you're doing multivariable MR, you need to consider multivariable gene environment equivalence. Is, 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 the, is, 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 your, uh, is the, your genetic indexing of your exposure, would it still be equivalent to the environment once you take the other things into account? This is something that's very much uh, being examined, the extent to which multivariable MR, if you, if you do know some of these factors, uh, can at least partly account, account for these things. And because uh, I started late, I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll finish on this. So there's no opportunities, I'm sorry, but I'll, <laughs> you might be back on YouTube, so I can go for your opportunity. I can, I can have, have some upbeat things. Uh, 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 this, this is showing that situation, looking at sclerostin, where there is a sclerostin is, is a SOS gene has now the cis variant and the SOS gene that relates reliably to circulating sclerostin. And uh, um, sclerostin monoclonals increase bone mineral density. They're no drugs used to increase bone mineral density. But once you, when, when you actually have when you actually have a large gene mass of sclerostin, quite a few of the variants for sclerostin actually pick up come from bone mineral density. When your when your bidirectional uh, uh, MR of BMD on sclerostin shows that BMD relates to higher sclerostin, and then. Uh, 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 whereas sclerostin using the cis variant relates to, to lower uh, B, uh, uh, relates to lower BMD, and the reason for that is you know biology is a feedback process. So increased BMD uh, would, would lead to some, would lead to to, uh, to move towards down regulation with increased sclerostin levels and decreased sclerostin levels increase BMD. So 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 quite often these these quite these these um, but they're fundamentally quite proximal uh, downstream phenotypes uh, of, 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 of a phenotype and will start becoming related in this way. And it would, would of course, it, it could of course be absolutely senseless using BMD variants as instruments for sclerostin. You'll get precisely the opposite answer to the answer uh, that, that you, should, you should get. So that's another uh, illustration of that. And I, I hope you'll get the opportunities. There are some opportunities, <laughs> uh, um, uh, which I will which I was good. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Please, anything which is new work that I showed that these people did, did that. Oh, I, I skipped Genevieve's thing. And uh, this this is a recent review that uh, Alan Sanderson did with a, a quite large group of people, which is uh, my, my view of the rest of the recent uh, MR review. And as Christmas approaches, and well, no, Tim needs leaving presents as well. I know Tim's leaving, so so this is a book that's just that's out. So this is the ideal Christmas present. <laughs> 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 We got time for a few a few quick questions. If you want to ask um, George any questions, can you use the mic? Oh yeah, any quest questions, guys, for George online or in the room? One at the back there, Katrina. Hi, uh, thanks for the lovely presentation, and uh, apologies, I missed the first bit, so this this question may be a bit ignorant of the introduction. Uh, 
being a non-geneticist, so coming more from the physiology and molecular biology side, uh, picking up on the maybe example of two mostly uh, mentioned uh, things, uh, the last part, CRP and vitamin D. May I assume then if we see an association and maybe um, simply maintaining my normalization is no negative, does it only mean there's no genetic link, but we still could be a strong physiological link? That is statistic or yeah no I, I wouldn't uh, I, I, if, if you've got a if you've got a good uh, genetic proxy that you know is a clean genetic proxy for your exposure then uh, uh, in those situations uh, then a null MR uh, would suggest that, 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 that the association you see is not uh, it's not physiological or, bi or biological. So, for example, the CRP situation where you've got genetic variants from motor region related to higher circulating CRP, that that, that CRP uh, does appear to have the downstream effects that, 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 that would be anticipated biologically from it. And similarly, with vitamin D, uh, there are four there's variants in four of the path of the vitamin D producing pathways that relate to vitamin D that reliably. Uh, replicate uh, the maybe I've chosen the wrong example. All I, I mean, as a concept, is if the Mendelian I mean, it, is null, does it mean uh, the symptoms no, no, of the genetic risk? No, I mean, the Mendelian randomization could be null uh, if you're using like you know the 2000 or 3000 variants from the, whatever the latest, I don't know, there are 2000, but anyway, the latest vitamin D G mice. You, you could be getting a null Mendelian randomization because you're because some of these higher level factors. Uh, like the, the, the factors upstream of vitamin D that you're picking up, like smoking, skin colour, uh, 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 education attainment, etc. Those are confounding. You then those those then become confounders. Actually, so the better example of that is I mentioned that the, the CHRNA5 variant related to smoking relates to lower BMI. That obviously that obviously does indeed confound the association to make it look like low BMI is not good for you. Because because you're because you're actually including smoking a variant related to heavier smoking uh, uh, amongst the genetic variants you're using for BMI. So so uh, so when you've got a very large number of anonymous slips, it is possible that that that, that, that you'll introduce uh, you actually reintroduce confounding by by those genetic variants being included uh, in, in your study. Let's say there is no errors for confounders or biased. If you, I think, I, I think if, if you've got a good instrument, you should see it. So, but if you're just saying there's no genetic risk, but this still could be a biological no, explanation, it's, it's removing environmental. It, no, it's removing it. It's removing. It's testing the environmental using. Yeah. It, and the answer is no. Yeah. So that if you you read, it was at the beginning of the book. Okay. okay. I've got, I've got a more general question, George. That you you touched on at the end, which is now we do have millions of individuals in Jupiter and yeah. thousands of variants. That is an opportunity, maybe you're a couple of months this, but you know, that is an opportunity to we've got more instruments. You know, 20 years ago, yeah. we, didn't have, we only had a couple. Where's how do we deal with that information? Because it is an opportunity for finding and making causal inference, but we've got all these problems yeah. with the with the upstream mechanisms I, to sort out is what's I I, I think that I think you would, uh, you, when you've just got a large of literally uh, sort of anonymous snips, it's, uh, I mean, it, it can add some evidence, but you can, you, you can, uh, you can be just, that, you, you can just, just be introducing confounding essentially. Yeah. And that's why to use negative controls. Yeah. Okay. So negative controls really are, really are quite powerful, it, 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 as I, saw, I think I showed in that, uh, in that situation. Andrew's got a hand up. Can we use the microphones? Oh, yeah. Just need to unmute uh, the button. It's great stuff. How much do you think problems have arisen? Because effectively, everybody's using Euclid Biobank. And actually, it is, in many cases, it's what's been used to create the signals. Yeah. And then it's being used to test things. So, what, what does that mean for what happens when you start to have just one data set, which is great that it's available, but it's yeah. dominated the, the whole... Uh, yeah, I, I, there, there, there then is a sort of problem of, uh, of overpicking, that, 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 that you not only uh, pick up like true upstream factors like smoking and BMI, you also just pick up 
idiosyncrasies within the UK Biobank. Uh, and if you just literally GWAS the whole of UK Biobank and then apply it to the whole of UK Biobank, then there will definitely be some overfitting issue. What you can do, uh, and Fang introduced a, an approach, which is a jackknife approach. When you divide it up into deciles, you GWAS 90% of, of it, and then you apply the, the GWAS from that to the other 10% to get your outcome estimates, and you get 10 outcome estimates, and you meta-analyze them. And that then doesn't suffer from the overfitting problem. Nick, that's it. Uh, Nick. Yes, so I was going to read out Tom Yates' question online. So um, Tom asks, are there methods to get around the negative feedback issue? Uh, he wondered whether using variants downstream of the receptor would be less vulnerable to this. Yeah, no, no that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. John. And I think, I think it's an, a point that, that you would, sort of, would need to be considered on very much on a case-by-case basis. Well, I don't think there's a sort of general answer of saying there are ways around it. I think it would depend upon the, 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 upon the biology. So, for example, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you sort of knew what a receptor did, uh, um, uh, then, then, that, then that might be possible. Uh, but yeah, but, but I, I, I would very much have to, have to know the exact case uh, uh, to, be able to, yeah, to be able to answer that. You've, you've created a bit of a monster, George, I think. <laughs> so I, I guess one of, one of the problems might be the um, quality of the genetic instruments themselves. So I guess there's always an assumption that they work in all scenarios, but I guess they themselves are just basically genetic associations. And there are many reasons why that they may not sort of be applicable in yeah. different populations or you know, even yeah. in context. So is one of the problems that people are, I guess it relates to what Tim mentioned, you know, these, these are all being really developed in UK Biobank and then maybe applied yeah. in China or wherever, where they yeah. may not work. I, I wonder, you know, how do we get around that? Because it... Yeah. Well, well, well that, 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 Because everyone's using your amazing software, well, but... That's, yeah, that, that's, why, that's why I say about uh, the, 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 I don't think that... I don't think there just should be just two sample MR papers appearing standalone with that being it. I, th I think I think that um, um, the Mendelian randomization can be sort of like part of a triangulation of evidence, which requires you to use uh, evidence from other sources, use things like negative controls, cross, you know, a, 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 this sort of this, this, this papers by this chapter in this book, this paper by Deborah Lawler on triangulation of evidence about the different sorts of uh, falsification tests. You can try and use, which includes cross-context comparisons. Does include cross-context comparisons. Uh, uh, I mean, in, a, in, in in some situations, for things like you know alcohol and smoking, you also you you, you have a sort of natural no relevance group for whom uh, you know uh, women in East Asian countries where they don't drink, and then, you, and, then, and, then, and then and then you get a really nice test of whether there's pleiotropy from that genotype because. In, in, the, in the women, it, it should, if it's pleasurable, it would relate to the outcomes, etc. There just needs to be a lot more creative, uh, yeah, uh, uh, creative thinking. But I do, I, I do see that, that largely, you know, uh, 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 MR, uh, the MR should be a component of appropriate triangulation of evidence, but not these standalone papers, which are very, it's, it's easy to do. Uh, it should be said. It should be said. They're all there on the web. You can, any, anyone can just find them. Yeah, one of themselves. So, uh, uh, Annika. Yeah, I had a, uh, another question. So, you mentioned that genetic studies you kind of always look at long term or lifelong uh, differences. Um, and shortly after we moved on to kind of genetic um, yeah. effects and kind of mentioned the interuterine environment. And I just wondered if you could comment on using Mendelian randomization studies um, around pregnancy because it's quite a defined yeah. timeline really rather than maybe a lifelong difference whether you could just comment on that 
Yes, I mean there are there are, there are some sort of life stages that come that you, you that can be distingu distinguished either because something like the intrauterine environment, you know that it, you you know if you're looking at the genetic variation in the mothers that that, that would relate to the intrauterine environment, you have the rather nice negative control of genetic variants in the in the, in the father, so you can actually say well it's either. It's either to do to the, with the intrauterine environment or something to do with maternal behaviour that has, diff, you know, there's different maternal behaviour, uh, behaviour, etc. Uh, for some biological processes with clear, clearly defined uh, uh, discontinuity points, if you like, like um, uh, adiposity, pre and post puberty, uh, you can you can demonstrate with with negative and positive controls. You can actually separate the. The, uh, the the effects uh, you know, the, the effects of adiposity uh, prepubertally from the effects of adulthood on adiposity, but you can't separate the effects of adiposity at thirty from adiposity at sixty. You, know, you, you, know, you just look at the genetic correlations. Uh, you look at negative positive controls, etc., and, and, and you can get uh, uh, and can get that, that that notion. I mean the um, the, the but the issue is, from, in many situations, you probably can't actually, uh, um, you know, say when the when the when when, when the, you can't use MR to say when the process is acting. But for something like vitamin D, which does protect against multiple sclerosis, uh, uh, you you can say that it's likely to be around the time people get HIV infection, whatever. So in a sort of triangulation framework, it can be useful for identifying life course. Uh, you know, life course process, the life course period of importance. Great, thank you very much, everybody, and thanks once again to George. We better stop there because we're actually taking, looking out the window, we're actually taking George onto a boat <laughs> in the, yeah. um, sort of into the English <laughs> Channel. So if you don't see him again, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I'd shown Tim any of Tim's papers, then you'd know that wasn't happening. <laughs> uh, but but uh, many thanks, George, that was fantastic once again. Great. Oh, there's some, there's some refreshments. There's some oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, refreshments. Yeah. Um, so hang around and ask each other. Strength. Hang around. Well, we've, we've got, there's another, George will be around for 20 minutes or so. so. There we got to uh, what? Two. Oh, one. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.